Hi everyone, this is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I'm here today talking with Dennis Villano, he's the Director of Technology Integration, and Patrick Larkin, who's the Assistant Superintendent of Learning in the Burlington Public Schools in Burlington, Massachusetts. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having us, Scott. Thanks. Uh, so let's take a minute or so, give us a quick overview of the district, the kind of community you serve. You know, Burlington has long been an innovative district, pushing uh, some different modalities of learning, so as you can acquaint us with some of those. So let's just on Sure. Thank you. Um, well, Burlington Public Schools, we're about uh, 12 miles outside of Boston, and we serve about 3,700 students. We have a high school of just over 1,000, one middle school of about... 800 kids, uh, four elementary schools, and one preschool. Um, so uh, we're pretty, um, we have a little bit of diversity. We have 20% of our uh, students, their first language is not English, but only 5% of those students are English learners um, at this point. So uh, we, we have over 50 languages spoken. Um, so there's, a, there's some great diversity in Burlington. Uh, it's, a, it's a great place to be. Um, at the elementary schools, we, uh, we do run an RTI model. Some people call it MTSS um, for our students. So we, we screen them routinely throughout the course of the year and give them targeted instruction for literacy and numeracy, um, depending on what they need. Um, and then we're pretty traditional with our middle school and high school approaches um, in Burlington. I don't know if you want to add anything, Dennis. Well, I mean, from the technology side, we're, we're a one-to-one -one district. Uh, we, we've really heavily relied on a remote one-to-one uh, -one learning program for several years, and we uh, emphasize using technology in the classroom when it's needed and, and however it's needed best, and I think that's been an interesting part of the, the current situation leading us into remote learning. Yeah, absolutely, and you know, I think Burlington was a pioneer on the one-to-one -one front for the state of Massachusetts through one of the earliest districts to go that direction. So tell us a little bit about the transition over the last couple of months. Was that made easier by your past history? What does learning and teaching look like there? Um, I, I do think um, it was made easier because of the types of teachers we have in our classrooms. Um, we, we do have, uh, it, the, the rug was yanked from under us on March 12th, it was a Thursday, there was some scuttlebutt that something might be coming. Um, and before the end of that day, we found out we weren't coming back on Friday. Um, and for, so the, the following two weeks, our focus was connecting, making sure kids were okay. How were they doing? Um, do they have what they need at home for us to be ready to uh, resume teaching and learning? Um, so at that point, we started what the state has called, I believe, uh, phase two. Of, uh, of their learning plan. And at that point, they were asking school districts to um, connect with students and revisit previously covered material, um, not to focus on anything new at that point. Um, and after a few weeks of that, um, they, they got to phase three where the state actually announced some prerequisite standards at each grade level. And these, these standards were seen as standards that would help prepare students to be successful at the next grade level. And so um, our, our work since that, um, I think we just finished our second week of that phase. Um, so our work has been focused on um, some new content over the last couple of weeks. Gotcha. So Dennis and Patrick, you know, it's one thing to have a tech savvy staff and student body. It's another thing to shift that into remote instruction uh, on very rapid notice, right? So, um, considering that you all had some fluency in the past, um, where still seem to have been some of the sticking points and challenges with that transition and how you all helped your teachers and families with that? Well, I think um, Dennis, you want to jump off on that one? Yeah, I think one of the first things was that we needed to make sure that everyone had access at home. That's still a challenge, even though we're a one-to-one -one district. One of the things that's interesting about how we do things, for K to eight, our devices actually stayed in the school. So they weren't going home regularly with students. Our high school devices did. They were a little bit more prepared. You know, as Patrick said, that Thursday everyone left and everything was left in the classrooms with, with no, nobody coming back to those rooms since that time. So the iPads were there. So we had to work on getting iPads and devices out to families that needed them. 
And it turned out to be a lot of families that needed the, the devices. And then we needed to provide support for families that needed internet connection at home. And we, we worked on that. And, and that was part of the initial, you know, even though we had a good technology system and we've had, as you said, a pretty tech savvy staff, we weren't ready. We, no one was prepared for just leaving school on a Thursday and jumping into remote learning right away. We, we, no one was prepared for that. Even with months of planning, it would have been difficult. I think our district was in a great position to do this, but there clearly were things that we needed to work on. Um, and, what, and again, once we were able to get people up and running and get connected, then we could focus more on what the content was going to be and what, the, what we were gonna put out for, through, for our curriculum resources. We really tried to focus on keeping everyone within a few different applications, keeping it as streamlined as possible. We use a couple of things that we use at elementary, middle, and high school. And uh, having those in place beforehand definitely was helpful. But again, nothing fully prepared us for that kind of situation. So yeah, we weren't, we weren't ready to go uh, full-time remote learning. That's not why we went one-to-one. Um, some people, I think, were surprised. Why weren't we jumping into live teaching right off the bat? Well, that's not what our goal ever was um, when we gave out all these devices. Um, I think one of the things we underestimated was um, the technological ability of parents. Um, our kids are very familiar with what we do in classrooms with certain resources, but I think one of our focal points um, in the summer and leading into the fall, if we're back in this type of a format, will be um, a lot of short tutorials for parents to get more comfortable with the tools that we're using. Got it. So, gentlemen, you know that I'm a proponent of what we might call deeper learning, right? This idea that kids have opportunities to not just do factual recall, but also to do uh, you know, critical thinking and problem solving, to do some inquiry and project-based learning, have lots of uh, agency in their learning at least some of the time, uh, maybe connect them to the real world around them and so on. Um, what I've seen in a lot of districts and schools, even if they were moving that direction before the pandemic, is that in many ways they've kind of reverted back to the basics, sort of those fundamental foundational um, you know, facts and procedures, because that was the easiest stuff to get out um, in, in a quick turnaround, right? Like we can get homework packets and worksheets out to kids pretty quick, digitally, paper, whatever. Um, so how has Burlington wrestled with that? I think the timing of it, honestly, um, I, I think the comfort level of the majority of teachers isn't there yet with you know, that type of instruction. But I do think our state's coming out with um, some guidance in mid-June as to what we can expect in the fall. Um, and I, I think I'm concerned, you know, that people are gonna say like, we have to focus on English and math, which of course we do, and push everything else to the, to the sideline. Um, there's a great opportunity here really to do some cross-disciplinary work um, through some of these um, inquiry units and, and do some of that development at this point. Um, I don't think it necessarily has to be as difficult as some people think it would be. So I, I definitely think that's something we're gonna be investigating because we don't wanna miss out on uh, some of the things that we're able to do when we have people um, you know, for a full school day in person. So I think there's an opportunity here and I hope we can take advantage of it. Cool, thanks Patrick. So. Dennis and Patrick, as you think about sort of how you all have responded over the last couple of months, what are some key leadership decisions or behaviors or support structures that you all have implemented that you think have worked really well? I think from, from my perspective, and I'm, I'm going to speak for something that Patrick and Dr. Conti, our superintendent, have been doing that I hear a lot of amazing feedback about is they focused on the needs of the families and the teachers first. It wasn't a direct jump to remote learning and curriculum. It was a focus on what was best for every, all the families at home. Patrick and, and Dr. Conti send out a morning message every day and I know that that's become a highlight for the teachers. I hear it all the time where they're talking about activities that are being shared or videos that people are putting together, um, you know, saying hi to students, uh, whether it's for you know graduation or just teachers doing their um, parades where they visit students. Those, e those emails have really gone a long way to make people feel more comfortable in a very difficult situation. And I think 
I do feel I'm very proud to be in Burlington that we, we focused on that first. The concern was about the well-being of everybody first, and that was really directed by Patrick and, and, and Eric Conti. And I know we've heard a lot of great feedback about that from families and teachers. Yeah, I think that was a no brainer. Um, if we want to really say that we focus on social emotional first, um, it starts with us. And so um, Dr. Conti, Eric and I get on a Google Doc every morning um, between six and seven, and then we send it out by eight o'clock. And um, we've gotten tremendous feedback from all the teachers. It's been great to say, con stay connected to them that way. Um, I hate email personally, but this has been a time I actually look forward to sending email and getting back in touch. People, you know, send me little clips of um, what's happening. And we've actually incorporated teacher voice into those morning emails, ask them to share what's happening with them. So um, it's it's been great. It's a way to stay connected when we're feeling um, very disconnected at this point. Yeah, and I think y'all are highlighting, you know, that it's not just our families that need care, but it's our staff as well, right? And, and our staff are doing some heroic work right now um, in schools all across America as they try to provide instruction for others in contexts that they weren't really ready for. And at the same time, many of them are also parenting their own kids or you know, taking care of seniors in their home or whatever. Um, so you know, there's some discussion in some sectors of the online world about learning loss, right? And concern that kids are gonna show up in the fall behind because of the pandemic. How do we balance that with sort of understanding that kids are still gonna to need to emotionally process, right? So uh, in other words, Patrick and Dennis, is how do we balance the social emotional well-being of our kids with this idea that we're actually in some ways behind with some kids academically? What does that tension look like in the fall? Well, I think it starts with social emotional, like we're all going to come back to the school in the fall and we've all been through some trauma on some level, some people more than others. So if we jump right into teaching and learning, um, you know, uh, academic content, I think we're doing ourselves and our kids a disservice. So I think even more community building will be done um, than has been done in the past. And I think that's really important. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we're going to be very slow. And um, there was some interesting stuff I was I was hearing about um, out of New Orleans when Hur Hurricane Katrina shut down their schools. Um, we can learn from that because they they thought they were going to have to come back and start with remedial work for kids. And I think they did that. And they found the kids were disengaged very quickly. So I think um, we have kids coming to new grade levels. Um, we're going to build community. We're going to start with grade level content. And then we'll see where the gaps are and we'll spiral um, and, and and fill the holes as necessary. But I think it's really important, um, again, to go back to your, whether it's inquiry or whatever our approach is, we need to focus on engaging content. Um, when we get to the academics, it needs to engage kids. They deserve that. They've been disconnected for a long time and we need to make sure that's a priority. Yeah, nicely said. So considerations, challenges moving forward, what's Burlington talking about and thinking about over the summer? Well, from my team's perspective, we're really thinking about ways that we're going to support people with the types of things that they're going to have to do in the fall. Remote learning is probably going to continue in some capacity in the fall. We don't know exactly what it's going to be. Uh, I think the biggest challenge I have in, in pretty much every conversation is this sense that things are going to go back to normal. It's going to be just like it has been. And I think it's hard to get through to people that it's not going to be normal. It's going to be different. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like. And so we're starting to plan for all of these different scenarios. We can't necessarily plan for one normal, no, the normalcy that we expect. So we're looking at all different ways to prepare teachers for that. We're, we're looking at ways to prepare families for that uh, and students. And that's been a challenge. I, I keep saying to people, try to think about this in a totally different way. And I think that sometimes is hard. Patrick and I know that a lot of our conversations, people tried to replicate what they've always done. And that's not going to happen here. So we're just looking at all the different possibilities, all the scenarios, and it's, it's a lot to take in. But I do think that we have, at least this time, we're not leaving on a Thursday and starting on, on Monday. We have a little bit of time here to prepare, time to, to talk to each other, to get some feedback, because I know Patrick is from parents and teachers, and that should help us along the way.
Yeah, it's going to be a busy summer. Um, I'm always excited about the work because there's new possibilities. Of course, I would prefer to go back to, you know, the way we had it before. But my biggest concern is for our youngest kids, the K-1-2, because um, once, first of all, it's harder to keep them engaged remotely. But secondly, from a practical standpoint, we always try to make sure our kids are on grade level by grade three, like make sure they're reading on grade level by grade three. And now we're not getting the time we would get with them in the classroom. So personally, this is my opinion. We haven't had district level conversations. Um, I think we really need to get those students into our school as much as possible, even if it's smaller groups. That's something I think we should be looking at. But again, I'm one voice. It's gonna be a community decision with a lot of stakeholders, but that's, a, that's something that I'm concerned about on top of a lot of other things. Yeah, I'm hearing from lots of folks that they're really wrestling with those younger learners and, and how to handle that. We continue these modalities in the fall. It's, you know, we had some grace because of the surprise factor this spring, but in the fall, you know, we really got to be more thoughtful and intentional and planful. Cool. Gentlemen, anything else you want to share? I just think, um, honestly, uh, it clarifies for us um, as a town, as a state, as a country, like how important teachers are. They, as you said, they are doing heroic work. It literally gives me goosebumps to see the efforts they're making. And they're doing this as so many other parents are with full families at home, taking care of elderly parents. Um, and it, they have been stopped. It's, it's really, um, it's been amazing. Awesome. All right. Well, we're kind of at the end of our time here. Dennis, Patrick, thank you very much for spending some time with me today. I know how busy you are. Good luck with the last few weeks of school. Say hi to Eric, your superintendent, for me, and well, uh, appreciate your time. Thanks, Scott. Thanks.